at the Colburn School, I was doing classical music, but also that's where I started playing jazz, just kind of off the cuff. And so we learned everything off of record. So I was always doing everything by ear that way. Um, and the you know the teacher was this great teacher. He's still there, Lee Seacard. And it's like sing what you play, and if you can you can play it, or if you can sing it, you can play it. I had a wonderful time chatting with today's guest. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contra Race Conversations, and we are featuring today the wonderful, talented Katie Thoreau, whose album Offbeat from 2017, it was named one of Downbeat's best albums of that year. She is on fire. She is playing everywhere, getting accolades left and right. And what a thrill to sit down and chat with her. Jeff Chalmers of Discover Double Bass suggested that I reach out. And I'd heard Katie's name before, but I just totally fell in love with her playing and what she's doing musically. I know you'll enjoy this conversation. I'd like to give a quick shout out to our sponsors, Upton Bass, D'Addario Strings, and Robertson and Sons Violins. More on all of them later. But let's get into this conversation with the wonderful Katie Thoreau. If you're on the inside, look out on the outside. Take this fool's advice, it's worth the sacrifice. And stay on your side. Cool. Well, so uh, Jeff Chalmers, who's the guy who runs Discover Double Bass, mm-hmm. he, he, I, I, I've... I've been familiar with your name. I've checked out your stuff before, but he said, you've got to chat with Katie. She's awesome. <laughs> She's doing so many things. And you've got to, you've got to, you've got to beg her to do a course for me for Discovered Double Bass. So outside of the interview, I'm just from Jeff. Jeff, my Jeff's message is please do a course for him. If you have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, he asked me and I, uh, I was kind of like, oh, what, you know, what can I bring to the table for you guys? So yeah, yeah, I'll work something out. Okay. Okay. That'd be cool. It's nice stuff that he's, that he's doing. I, I, I was checking out this course with Adam Ben Ezra with mm-hmm. all these drumming techniques and that kind of thing. Oh, cool. And it's really, it's well done. So yeah, I, I um, Danny uh, Zimmerman or yeah. Simon. Da- Danny Zeman. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I checked his out. It yeah. was really great. Yeah. It's nice. It's nice. And yeah, Jeff's good people. And, and mm-hmm. so, yeah. Cool. So you're not on the road right now. Okay. A little break. Or yeah, a little, you, yeah, a little okay. break. Yeah, it was kind of planned. It's nice, and um, I teach at a college out here, so I catch up with all my students. Where Where do you teach? Uh, it's a community college. It's called Mount San Antonio College. Okay. Oh wow, nice. Yeah, Th- those are some lucky students. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fun. I just kind of sneak under the radar, and I I I love teaching, and I love hanging out. With are you uh, are you teaching voice and bass, or coaching uh, j- uh, jazz ensembles, or what? What are you doing there? There, I just do um, just straight up bass lessons. Okay. Yeah, okay. sometimes people will want to get like a vocal bass lesson, but it's so hard for them to commit. You know, they just want to do one lesson, mm-hmm. so it's a little bit for me. It's kind of annoying. Yeah. What can you do in one? It's, it's hard. It's like the beginning of a very long journey. I think fe- like, yeah. like it's more like a master class or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Wow. What's a base lesson with your students there look like? Like what are you, what are the students like? What are you working on with them? Well, I, I lo- love it because, um, so this is my fourth semester there and some of them couldn't read music. They couldn't walk a baseline and now they're all reading great and they're playing bass lines just so easy so it's so much fun to get them to basically from nothing to walking a bass line on anything yeah yeah it, um how important so so how do you get someone to read like like at, at that age what what do you work on with them are you just like this like good boys do fine always or are you breaking out samandal or the real book or like what what are you doing yeah, oh yeah, I love Samandal. So it's kind of like I'll use whatever materials they're comfortable with. And I've got, I grew up with Samandal, uh, the George Vance, Fade Mekum, 
and I use, I love the Raboth book, but sometimes that's a little too much. But for these guys who only play electric bass, they're used to being in that upper region of the neck. So almost the, the Raboth stuff is a little bit easier, those crazy fingering. Um, no, 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 that, no, 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 that's, I, uh, the, the Raboth, I love that. I found, so I'm just curious because I used to teach um at DePaul University in mm-hmm. Chicago yeah. and I taught I it was they sort of had that old school model where they have the jazz teacher but then they have the classical person oh, who yeah. teaches the you know I don't know that I believe in that model really but yeah. I, I was happy to teach and do that but it was it was interesting like working with these students that mostly wanted to do jazz or not play Bodicini yeah. at least and like try to figure out like what can I do to build their technique up um in a way that's useful you know, and I found that the yeah. Raboth, the Raboth approach just seemed to work really well because it was navigating, you know, in position. I found that so yeah. it sort of clicked with with what's useful for a jazz player. Sure, yeah, and for for reading music, what I found really works is, you know, they're learning to play bass lines at the same time, so I'd have them write out bass line for themselves. And then really, you know, this is B flat, but not the one on the on the lowest line. It's the one above the top line and mm-hmm. just write it out for themselves. It's like, you know, just learning, learning a language. And then it just clicks. Yeah. yeah. Cool. What, who did you study with growing up in L.A. Uh, on, on bass? Yeah. So my first teacher was uh, Dr. David Young sure. when I was eight years old. So I started with him when I was eight and I had played violin when I was four for four years and was pretty bad. Mm-hmm. And um and I'm around all these, you know, little kids who are like playing crazy concertos and stuff. And I was still playing Mary Had a Little Lamb. Um, so my mom suggested playing bass. And um, it was at the Colburn School in downtown L.A., but it was when it was pretty ghetto, mm-hmm. um, not in this huge building. And then he was my first teacher and just I had a little quarter size bass. And, um, he was just so, so great. It was like, hold the bass however you want. Here's the bow. I, lo- I loved baseball. He was like, just hold it like a baseball glove. And um, that was it. So he, I studied with him um, for a couple of years. And then I studied with Peter Rofe when mm-hmm. I was 12. And that was awesome. It was great because he was small. I was small. And he was all about that Raboth crab technique and the hand stretching. And I was like, oh, okay, I can, I can do that. And, um, and then I also studied with another great bass player. And I think he kind of stopped altogether, Francis Singer. And um, he was a great teacher. A lot of us people my age, like he was all all of our bass guru. That's a name I've heard, but yeah. So he's not active anymore. It sounds like I, I think. Yeah, I think he. I think he had enough. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's great. So you were you were steeped in that Raboth kind of approach, and and David Young. He's like one of those young bass teaching legends. Oh yeah, I mean, he's yeah, still, he's incredible. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was cool because we. I would. Um, he'd have master classes with people from the phil so dennis trembley um i got to do a workshop with raboth when i was like 10 years old and so it's been a it's been great wow uh what was so i've i've been to colburn within the last couple of years in the mm-hmm. facility you know the new facility and the nice facility what was the yeah. old facility like it was i think it was the audio visual department of usc so it was like one of those big warehouses yeah. but with wanger practice rooms so it's like the ceilings were like 30 feet and then you had these little practice rooms and that was it. And then all of a sudden they had this big, uh, you know, they built it downtown. And then after I left, they built about a hundred percent more of it. It just got nuts. And I, I can't, I get lost in the building. Now. Yeah, it's, a, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous facility. It's fun to watch downtown LA transform. And, and I, I'm, I lived in Chicago for 20, 20 some years and some, pretty recent Californian, but I've had family in Southern California, you know, my whole mm-hmm. life and have come out. Um, what, how is totally random switching gears, but how has LA changed as a city or like a, as an art, as a place for the arts since you've been there? It seems like, especially downtown, things are just popping in a way that they, they weren't a few years ago. Yeah. When I was a kid, um, it was like really one of those working towns after 5 PM would be a ghost town. There'd be nothing to do down there. But on the other hand, um, there was a bunch of jazz clubs, not in the downtown area because there's a bunch of L.A. spots. So there's a lot of clubs that aren't there anymore. Um, so that that has changed 
there and there's one club downtown, <clears throat> the Blue Whale, which I'm which is exciting because it kind of bridges that gap of jazz nerds with regular working day people because it is downtown and in a location where they're building, you know, high rise condos and and now it's a place where people will go after work. Mm-hmm. And it's a fun place to hang out, not just to go listen and be intellectual. Have you felt, because uh, I've talked with all kinds of different people for the podcast, but, you know, a, a common topic talking to anybody in the jazz world is moving to New York. Like, <laughs> is that, and that, but then they're all, I also talk to a lot of people, uh, that ba- like Miles Mosley, for example, but some mm-hmm. of them based, based in, in LA, based in Southern California. Have you felt the urge to relocate to New York or um, maybe would you mind talking? I'm sure you've thought about that or talked about that with people in the past. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, when I was, I went to Berkeley College of Music in Boston and I went, um, <clears throat> I went there straight from right after high school, but I was already in high school the last two years was working a couple of nights a week in Los Angeles. And I was like, Oh, this is, this is great. Maybe I'll just keep doing this. And then the opportunity came up to go to Berkeley for on a full ride. So I, you know, take the opportunity. And, um, after a couple of months, I started to go to New York, you know, a couple of weekends a month, just kind of test the waters, check it out. Um, and it was great, but I could only ever stand just a couple of days there. Uh, you know, just the, mainly the, you know, the weather and that's why I live, that's why I live in Southern California. But, um, just the whole, the vibe and atmosphere. I didn't want my whole life to be centered around some competitive kind of aspect and just be that one idea happening all the time. Uh, but I love going back there and I go back there, you know, I do probably go back there about once a month to, to play and, and see friends. Um, but you know, you can go anywhere on an airplane. That's, so that's why I, I choose to live here, but I do love going out there and, and playing. And it's amazing that you can see music like 12 hours of the day, every single day of the week. It's incredible. Yeah, totally. And I, I love, I love visiting New York city. I mean, it's obvious who, who doesn't, but, and just the creative yeah. energy of that place is amazing. There's this, there's this interesting article um, that I've, I've referenced several times. It came out maybe three, four years ago by Moby. Cause you know, Moby mm. was a long time uh, New York city resident and he moved to LA a few years ago. And it was all about why I moved from New York to Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just it, the kind of the I don't know if you ever saw that article, but the premise no, was was it's really interesting because the premise is it, it's too risky to fail in New York City. Like mm-hmm. like like the worst thing that happens if you fail in L.A. is you end up in what is it North Hollywood or whatever the bad yeah. Hollywood. You know? Yeah, <laughs> New York, you're out, and I and I you know you you can't pay rent. And I think about that living yeah. in San Francisco too, kind of oh a my similar gosh, yeah. thing. And I thought that was really interesting. And the other thing he said about is that like. The, the culture of just being around actors and people in the, in the movie world is like failure is just almost a little bit a part of life. Like mm-hmm. everybody's got to flop. And, yeah. and, and, and that almost gives you a little more permission to be artistically creative and experimental. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I, I, I just, I, it's, I, so it's cool to see and, and both, you know, in terms of jazz, but also arts in general in LA, it just seems like such a vibrant place to be located um, these days. Yeah. Yeah. It is. There's a lot of, um, it's an exciting time. And I feel like there's other people outside of the music world who are interested as well. Yeah. You know, they, they want that to be a part of their life too. So I've got a, I've, I, I, I'm a fan of these huge, horrible questions that have no answer, but like, if you sure. don't mind, let me, let me just throw one your way. I have a lot of, of young people that listen to the podcast and I have a lot of base moms and dads that yeah. listen and their kids are getting ready to go off and do something in the music mm-hmm. world. Um, and you know, I, in all my different teacher roles I've had, I've been in the position a lot of like talking to the kid about to head off or talking to mom or dad. Yeah. And, and like, here we are in 2018 and you've obviously you're, you're, you're having, uh, what, what seems like an incredibly thriving career and this interesting mixture of, of voice and, and bass and, and all the opportunities. Um, what would you tell someone or their mom or dad <laughs> about to embark, about to head to Berkeley or USC, or maybe they're there and they're thinking about the next step? Like what's, what's the professional world look like and opportunities look like right now? Uh, 
I, I really do think that there's a ton of opportunity if, if that's what you think. And if you don't think that, then there's not going to be any opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, I do, you know, for people heading off to school, it's, if that's what you want to do, you got to be focused and be cool with in school right now. And that's okay. You know, you don't need to try and get gigs or get famous or anything. Just study. That's what you're there to do and learn. And who knows, you might take a different path because like I tell students, it's like, you don't have to play music, but maybe you get interested in sound engineering and you got to know a little bit about music or production, lighting. Um, and if you don't do it all together, we need audience members. So it's, you know, there's some sort of appreciation or become an educator. Um, something I do, I didn't really think was beneficial before, but I do now is, you know, really having a good instrument that you can work with if that's going to be yours for a few years. So I, you know, and I take care of my instrument and when I was in school, I took care of it. So I think, I think that is important having the right equipment, right strings. Yeah. It, it makes such a difference. It's, and it's one of those things. I remember some of my students at DePaul were on just subpar basses, right? And you're just yeah. sort of locked up. You're fighting. You can't, it's hard to open up and relax. And I was just working with a student yesterday who is, who is, who brought this beautiful pace old in really mm-hmm. nice space. And I, I was talking to him and, and his mom actually. And I just like, as soon as you get a good instrument that you're not fighting with, that's not going to hold you back. It's like, it, op- it seems to open up all these doors. Yeah. People get better exponentially faster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a huge yeah and, if, and if that's what you, you know, make the investment, if that's what your passion and goal is, mm-hmm. and it doesn't have to be $30,000, you can get some nice instruments for a little totally. bit cheaper. Yeah. Hey, Jason. How are you? Hope you're well. Um, thank you for asking me about the, the Dario strings and what do I like about the Dario strings. Um, well, I've been using them for about six or seven years. Um, I use the Zyx medium set. Um, what I like about it is that for me it has provided a sort of like a really good compromise. I like the 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 feel under my fingers is great because it's sort of like a gutty feel. The strings are thicker than general, uh, generally metal strings are. And I used to play with like an olive G before and Spiracore. So it kind of like recreates that feel. And it's the strings are loose. They're not super tight, like definitely a lot less tight than any of the Dario um, metal uh, steel strings. Um, and I really like that part about it, that it just, like, I kind of feel like the synthetic core strings have, like, this, um, gutty kind of feel. Um, then they have a depth to them that I really like. At the same time, they have also a nice, um, attack, especially for pizzicato, jazz pizzicato, which is what I do mostly. And at the same time, they also bow really well. My bow sticks to them greatly. Um, I do have to wash, clean the the strings a few times if I'm bowing because I like to cake my bow with quite a lot of rosin. Um, but overall, um, they're just a great uh, sort of like um, catch-all string for me. Um, I would say the only thing that it's perhaps not as great about them is that every six months... Uh, I feel like they start going out of tune and then I think that I'm playing out of tune and what's wrong with me? And it's like, oh, the strings must be wearing out. And then I uh, change them and then they're great again with the new set. Uh, So that's all. Love those Zyx strings. And I'm very, very happy to be the Dario artist. They're great people and um, very lucky about it. Thank you so much, Jason. Take care. Well, um, how you, uh, when you were at Berkeley, how would you spend your time? Were you were you locked up in that practice room? Were you going out and playing shows? Were you taking in shows? What what did your time in that undergrad degree look like? Um, I was very interested in general electives, so I took a mm-hmm. lot of you know English classes, history classes, um, which was great because I like it was the same thing about moving to New York. I to just have everything just be music was kind of boring to me Mm -hmm. you know i like to have another type of perspective so i had a lot of fun and all the teachers are from harvard and from these great like boston University. so it was awesome to get a nice well-rounded uh 
education. And um, yeah, I was in the practice room a lot. Uh, but to be honest, I actually practiced, did, you know, I practiced so much when I was young. And then I practiced so much after I got af- out of school. I did my master's at Cal State Long Beach. And, you know, like I remember the day I graduated, you know, just like, oh, now I can do those six hour days and just really like do whatever I want now. What, you know, I had an interesting conversation with a jazz pianist named Mike Coker, fabulous player. He, he runs the jazz program down at Arizona State. But- 99% sure it's Arizona State, but he used to teach at Northwestern, and he was talking to me during my master's, and he said, Jason, the best thing that's going to happen for you is getting out of school, and you're going to mm-hmm. have that time to structure, because I, I also, like you, I was really into the, uh, the, my academics. I love mm-hmm. history, and I love literature and English, and I was really, and it was really interesting to all of a sudden have that, free, it was interesting and terrifying, but yeah. to have all that free time and to be able to structure it. So I had those six-hour days in yeah. front of me too. How did you organize your time all of a sudden, like with like, like if yeah. you're taking six hours, like what are what are you doing with that time? Or what were you doing with that time? So to backtrack a little bit, I um, started studying with John Clayton when I was doing my graduate degree or maybe right after, no, it was a little bit during it. And I met him when I was in high school, but I was too afraid when I moved back to town to like get in touch with him. I wanted to study with him because I wanted you know, ready. Yeah. And, um, and then I took a lesson with him and it was, it was great. It's, it was like, you know, being in a different universe and I just his approach and his whole way of practicing really helped me structure it, you know, just having, and I do it now and I kind of made my own sheet too, but like what, you know, what are you going to do today? Um, what transcriptions do I want to play? I'm gonna, what am I going to transcribe? I'm going to learn a tune. Just like having a nice organized list. Um, and just six hours sometimes wasn't even enough to get everything I wanted to do. So just if I wanted to spend two hours playing a three octave B flat major scale, I could do that. It was great. Uh, so you like writing things down or you did at that time. Yeah. It was super helpful. Yeah, I still yeah. do. That's in, you know, even if I just have an hour to, to practice, I'll write down what I want to do. Cause then, you know, you get, it's different if I'm just going to just pick up the bass and play that's, that's great and that's fun. But when I really want to work on something, I'll write it down. You know, start with a scale, play some old transcriptions just to get me going and maybe transcribe a chorus or something, and learn a song, you know, because it just, you know, you want it to be productive and see some sort of progress. So John Clayton, like one of my favorite bass players, certainly one of many people, such an awesome, yeah. awesome person in so many ways. Um, I've never actually played for him or done a, I've taken a lesson with him. What, what's mm-hmm. he like? as as a teacher very just completely supportive like if you know if you were on a baseball team or a basketball team it's like he's the coach and he it's you know that unconditional love but also you can play better and what can we do to make you be better and you need to understand how you how you practice how you learn um but just completely supportive and and a genius you know if you play something for him you've you've written or worked on, he can play it right back to you and be like, Oh, maybe you'll try this fingering or do that. Um, be- before I chat with folks, I love to go online and, and a lot of the people I talk to, they don't really do a lot of interviews because they're, mm-hmm. they're just in an orchestra or whatever, but you've done a lot of interviews. So it's fun <laughs> to sort of look and see what, what, um, and, and something that came up, I don't remember what, which one, but you, the, there was a line that you bug people a lot that you want to work with. It was about Jeff Hamilton and maybe about John Clayton too. I don't know. I'm, I might be misquoting this, but, but you're trying to reach out to somebody that you want to work with. Um, what, what would you do to, to try to make that connection with like Jeff Hamilton, for example, or, or somebody like that? Yeah. Well, yeah. For instance, he, um, you know, amazing drummer and he played with my, my, my hero, Ray Brown for so many years. And uh, it was kind of another one of those John Clayton things. I didn't want to know if I was quite ready to to meet him. Uh, but I actually forgot we had met when I was in high school and I won an award from the LA Jazz Society. And he kind of remembered me from then. And uh, I went to go see a concert of his, showed up really early and um, would go to every concert he was at, started learning all his book, all his uh, trio book to get to know it. And um and, you know, people see that you're serious. And so that when you ask them questions and 
you want to work with them, they take you seriously. So it was great when I asked him to produce my, my first record. And he's like, well, I've never done that before. But, and I was like, yeah, I think you'd be great. Let's, let's give it a go. Um, but it's nice. And also someone like Ken Poplowski, who was on my last record, an amazing tenor saxophone and clarinetist. I really wanted to play with him because he's just so good. And we were going to be on a festival together in Vail and we only had one set together and it was a jam session. Oh, okay. Those are sometimes iffy because you never know what's going to happen. But I had learned his last record and, and most of his other records, all the songs that he liked to play. And I came up with a list and of all of these songs and he was like oh i like that song that song's great too he's like hey these are all the songs i do i was like yeah i know i really want to play with you and so then after that day he said you know we got along we played well and and we got along as people too so it was great and he's like well you know if i ever have something in new york uh you can you can come out i'll call you or vice versa i'll just call you and then a couple weeks later he called me to come play at birdland with him um so that's that's kind of what it takes too. What I would tell students, you know, if there's something you want to do, the sky's the limit, really. If you, whoever you want to play with, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to play with them. Um, so, something else I read that that I loved. I wanted to ask you about. Uh, I read somewhere that your favorite key is D flat. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Which I, if I were to ask one of my or you know, they would say probably G is their favorite key or yeah. certainly oh, not G, G flat. Yeah. But what what is about D flat that you is that is that a vocally D flat or just the sound of D flat or D flat? I love the I love the sound of it, especially on on my instrument and, and on other basses. And I love uh you know when you get past the the thumb thumb stop, like how it how it feels there and you can really move around there. <clears throat> yeah, I love D flat. I would say D flat and then G. Do do keys have a different feel or mood or or emotion to you, like like on the bass or as a vocalist? Like, do you associate? Some, I'm just curious. I know that like you read about composers in the past, and they would sometimes talk about like G would have a different sound than like A minor versus. And do you do you associate? Do you have associations with specific keys, like mood or anything like that? Not necessarily a specific key, but you know if something's not sounding quite right then i'll change the key and it'll just pop okay you know sometimes when i write you know if it's an original song and i there's an example i wanted to write it in a flat and it didn't sound good and i changed it to c and then all of a sudden it just opened up um i, I also got to ask i'm super curious about i had the the opportunity to go to dubai a few years ago and mm-hmm. did, did not foolishly did not go one of these days i will but I know you were there at playing at Quincy Jones's club, right? Yeah. In Dubai yeah. for for a for a chunk of time. Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, for almost three months. Okay. Wow. So um, maybe what was that like uh, pl- doing that? And maybe you could just talk about how that opportunity came about. And then also, I just love to know what's it like playing jazz in Dubai. I mean, my goodness, I, I that sounds fascinating. <laughs> yeah. So it, that opportunity came about. Um, Actually, at that same festival I was talking about where I met Ken Poplowski, I also met fantastic pianist Justin Coughlin. Um, and he, my brother's a bass player too, Dominic, and he met him a couple years before they were at, at this camp together. So I kind of knew who Justin was. It was another one of those like beautiful moments where you meet someone and you play and it just fits perfectly. And then he is just an awesome person. So we got along real well. Um, and he is, uh, managed by Quincy Jones and actually has a great film that they put out called keep on keep it on, um, which I recommend is, is so great as an educational tool. And, um, it was Justin, it was funny. He just called me up like a couple months later and said, Hey, do you want, can you play Monterey jazz? Festival? It's like, yeah, of course. And, um, so that was great. And so and then we played a couple other gigs in LA and we met Quincy Jones. He was there. Um, and it was just so cool. He just sat right in the front row and we were playing something and he just started yelling out Ray Brown because they were great <laughs> friends. Actually, Ray Brown was Quincy Jones's first manager way back in the day. Wow. Um, so that's how I met Quincy. And then he opened up this club in Dubai at um, uh, Donatello Versace's brand new hotel. And his management company was looking for talent to do some long-term things. And they asked if I would 
want to take my group out there. So that's how that came about. Um, and just the opportunity to play. We were playing three concerts five nights a week. And it's like I equate it to being a heavyweight champion. It's like when you get to practice and do that every single night, it's like we were at, we were on fire by, by the end of it. It was great. <laughs> we were like macho. Just we could do anything. <laughs> Um, and playing, playing jazz there was, was great because, you know, a whole new audience every single night, a lot of international, you know, everyone is international there pretty much since they're not from there. Um, so getting to expose people, either exposing people to new, new music, or there were some like hardcore jazz fans there. Like the second night I was there, this guy was like requesting deep Ray Brown cuts. I was like, okay. I, you can come every single night. Um, but really just uh, letting people into what we do, you know, and not forcing something on, on people and just finding, finding what works and what, um, you know, keeps people, uh, keeps people's attention. And it was really a great practice. Wow. This episode is brought to you by Robertson and Sons Violins. For more than 40 years, over four decades, Robertson and Sons has specialized in providing the highest quality string instruments and bows to collectors, professional musicians, music educators, and students of all ages. Their modern facility, which is totally beautiful, by the way, if you're ever able to make it out to Albuquerque, New Mexico, I highly recommend it. They have a recital hall that they use not only for performances, but it's available to their clients. So if you want to try out a fine pedigree bass or even a student bass or anything in between, you can go in that recital hall. I've had the chance to do that. Totally amazing. I'm like a kid in the candy store when I'm down there at Robertson's. Check them out online at robertsonsviolins.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by Upton Bass. And have you checked out this new travel bass from Upton? Oh my goodness, what a cool looking design. What a great sounding bass. It's just totally remarkable. And the way that they're launching this product, it's just so perfectly upped in. It's uh, bold, it's innovative. You gotta check out these videos of Gary Upton unfolding, I don't even know how you describe it, putting together, I guess, this travel bass. It takes almost no time. It is in a Samsonite piece of luggage. I kid you not. It is just the suitcase. It is literally a suitcase base, but it comes together and it's a real base. It's a nice sounding base. So cool. Just another example of the way in which Upton is innovating and blazing new trails for the base community. So thank you for what you do, Upton, and thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. <laughs> Okay, so like one who has never been to Dubai might not think that there'd be good jazz audience in Dubai. But actually, it makes sense if you think about it because it's, it's such an international hub. It's like, yeah. the, I know it's not the Las Vegas of the Middle East, but it probably has some elements, you know, in terms yeah. of like the draw and that kind of thing. Where are some other places? How did, or maybe a better question, how do jazz audiences, if they do, differ in different places? Like, are, are LA audiences different than New York audiences? Or are there, do you have any specific? Places that, that you just love the audience every time you go there. I, I, I think about that a lot with, I'm mostly a classical player, and I notice mm -hmm. that even in, oh, yeah. in classical. So I'm sure it's got to be the case in jazz, too. Uh, I've had a lot of fun recently going to Denmark. And the oh. audiences are incredible because they're like, they know so much about the music. And when they love something, they'll all clap in unison. So you'll get, and it was funny because then it, it reminded me, um, I had, there's, you know, these Oscar, Oscar Peterson records in Denmark or in Finland and there's all this unison clapping and I'm like, Oh, it's the unison clapping. This is great. They love it. Uh, so I always felt really welcome there. And then there's just some rooms, um, in the country that in here that are just old jazz rooms. There's a place, uh, a little bit South of San Francisco called the Bach Dynamite and Dancing Club. And they've had everyone from Cedar Walton, Ray Brown, just everyone had been there. And it's just these old, heavy, steeped jazz rooms. 
uh, also in Chicago, the Green Mill was, oh, yeah, it did, did two, two great nights there. And it was unbelievable. It was like packed with people and they were totally attentive when they needed it to be. And then on the breaks, we're having a good time, but it was, you just felt so welcome. I love the Green Mill. That I would go there all the time when I was back in Chicago. And yeah, they're they're great audiences. I have mm-hmm. been shooshed by the club yes. manager for like yeah. being I didn't think I was I would guess I was getting too excited with yeah. you know, but what a what a cool place and stepping back in time, you know, mm-hmm. Prohibition and Capone and all of that and the bus. Exactly. And, and it's just such a great room to he- hear jazz in. It's just a fantastic yeah. experience. Yeah. Right. Um I I, I used uh, another place in Chicago that I used to live about a half a mile from the jazz showcase and mm-hmm. it was so fun to just be able to walk up with my wife and get a drink and see like some of the best acts in the, yeah. in, in, you know, there are coming through. But I, I also, I'm curious. So you were at Berkeley and then you went to Ecuador, right? To, to do some teaching. Am I getting that chronology yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. What, yeah. what did you, oh, how did that, come to be first of all uh going to teach in ecuador and then what was that experience like uh working with those students and in your role there yeah so when i was at berkeley i i finished in three years in the summer i was graduating it came up an opportunity to go um they needed a teacher to teach bass and voice actually and um uh so i took it okay. so i took that <laughs> oh and uh <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to think. It's an international Berkeley school. So it was like all the Berkeley curriculum. Oh, okay. They, they've got a bunch of schools like in Japan and India and things like that. So it, it wasn't um, – and I was young enough to be like, yeah, let's go for it. Um, so I had about together like 30 students mixed of bass and voice and an ensemble. Uh, so it was full-time teaching down there. Um, and it was great. I mean – I I spoke Spanish and I spoke it much better then than I do now, but they were all proficient in English. But it was like amazing to meet these kids in Ecuador at the equator who were like so heavily into music or I got to show them different things. And their goal essentially was to go to another Berkeley school. Mm. Um, And there's been some really successful students from there, but it's like this little, this little tiny pocket of jazz happening and all these kids are into it and you know they were so great at pirating everything too so they would they would always print out like like give me dvds or, or music or stuff that you couldn't get anywhere else <laughs> um but then you know they just wanted they just loved the music and had the they at that time in their life when they can just be into it uh, what a cool experience that must have been that yeah must have been... yeah it was awesome um I got to, I got to, so I mentioned Jeff Chalmers earlier, Discover Double Bass. He asked me to ask you a couple of things. Um, sure. well, one of which we've covered, which is, uh, kind of your experiences with John Clayton, but, but one, and I, I'm, you've been asked this plenty, I'm sure, but it'd still be interesting is like how singing has informed the way you play bass and whether, how it's made you play more melodically, develop your oral skills or anything like that. So just broadly, how do you think singing has informed your bass playing? Uh, you know, I, I grew up singing everything that I would play. So like, even when I'm playing bass line, I'll sing them. Sometimes I got to tone it down a bit because I don't like it to be very audible, but it's like, I always, you know, I, I, at the Colburn school, I was doing classical music, but also that's where I I started playing jazz, just kind of off the cuff. And so we learned everything off of records. So I was always doing everything by ear that way. Um, and the, you know, the teacher was this great teacher. He's still there, Lee Seacard. And it's like, sing what you play. And if you can, you can play it or if you can sing it, you can play it. Um, and then while I'm playing, it's like the intonation on the bass has got to be spot on or else vocally it won't work. And I'll be annoyed mm-hmm. with myself. And I was just thinking about that yesterday. It's, I don't ever sing with another bass player in the times I've done it. It's really weird. Cause I'll be thinking like, oh, I wouldn't play that or whoa, I just missed that chord. Or that's uh, they've played a minor third on a major third chord. Can't do that. There's actually there's only one bass player. I had a really fun time, and he's another great teacher in L.A., Richard Simon. And it was like ah, oh, just the, the most perfect. It was great. Um, but yeah, and then then you get to the point where you don't think about anything, and you just you're just on a on a wave. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but I think would say like starting off, it's all about intonation, and then from that point being able to play an interesting bass line while you're singing. 
Wow. Um, I can't even imagine. I, <laughs> I, can, I can barely talk and play. Uh, yeah. Another question from Jeff. I'd love to hear your answer. Just favorite trio. What are you? You really shine in that kind of setting. What What are some of the trios that have inspired you the most, or just your favorite trios in general? Favorite trio. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Oscar Peterson trio, and and all of them. I love all yeah. of them. You know, just the ones with without drums with Herb Ellis, and then every single iteration he had from that point on. Uh, same with Ray Brown. Just amazing. I think that those. The songs he chose and the arrangements, when you first hear them, they're sim- they're, they sound simple. And then you go to transcribe it and you're like, oh, wow, he just changed keys like 10 times. And, oh, there's a bar five in there somehow. Um, Bill Evans, too, especially. Again, all the trios because there's something special about each one of those. Um, I also love the Ray Brown, Herb Ellis, Monty Alexander trio, the triple treat. Because, again, great songs, just little hip arrangements. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd love to, if, if we could take Bill Evans trio for a second, because Chuck Israel's is a, fr- as a friend of mine and listens mm. to the podcast and mm-hmm. we've talked, I've, I drove from Portland to Eugene and back with Chuck, mm. uh, a couple months ago. And all we did was talk about Bill Evans. Yeah. <laughs> so what is it? And obviously there were several different bass players through that trio, but what do you like about that trio and the different iterations in particular? Um, uh. I think the first record I really, I think the first one I had was Exploration, the first record. And it's like, okay, this is totally different from what I was used to it's melodically, sound-wise. And then the second one, so going in order that I had was um, Everybody Digs Bill Evans. Mm-hmm. And just so, you know, to hear uh, that that bass and drum combination with his piano playing. And he was so free because, you know, they stayed they stayed with it yeah. and to hear him being able to do those, you know, quintuplet lines and everything and his whole thing was incredible. Um, and then I got into the Scott LoFaro thing and then that's a whole nother story getting into his, it's like, he's like the Beatles for me. It's like every day I'm like, how is this possible? <laughs> um, so then getting into that whole thing and then, um, uh, you know, like you must believe in spring that, that whole record, it's just like, you can just keep going on. And on. Uh, because harmonically, there's so many things to choose from. And it's like, you feel like it's skating, but it's it's not. And um, I was lucky in LA, um, Joe LaBarbera, the drummer, lives here. He played with, him with Bill Evans. He was his last drummer. And it was like, you know, you get to talk with him about it too. And just how melodic, but solid. And yeah, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, like Ray Brown, I, you know, another huge topic. But like, if I think of bass players where I hear two notes, and I know who it is. Mm-hmm. Like Ray Brown, right? Yeah. So, um, how did Ray Brown influence your playing? What, what, uh, maybe, maybe talk about that a, a little bit. Yeah. So, when I was playing bass, when I was starting out, like, so I started playing jazz when I was about twelve. Um, just because I was at the Colburn school and the teacher walked by and he was like, we need a bass player. And I said, well, I don't play jazz. I got to read music. He's like, it's okay. You'll be fine. So that, so that was just like, from that point on, everything was cool. Um, and I listened to all sorts of music. Uh, and then when I heard Ray Brown, it was just, you know, that feeling you could feel his, the beat and like the, I don't know, the, the drive and the happiness all at one point. And I couldn't, play it I couldn't do it and it didn't bother me I just kept trying and then it was kind of like one day everything fell into place because I I always knew that I had good time in a good beat but like those bass lines and, and the soloing too but it didn't bother me I was I just loved playing so I knew that one day it would happen because I remember trying I transcribed um his bass line on FSR and I, I could barely do it and I was, I was like 12 or 13 I was like it's okay I'll I'll get there you know <laughs> Um, but transcribing, even just like simple blueses of his, you'll look at it and you're like, oh man, he's playing, he plays the same turnaround so much, but it sounds so different every single time. And then the solos, it's like, um, it, I don't, I don't even know how to explain it. It's just like, we all have our favorites. It's just my favorite, the sound. Um, so I worked a lot on that, just getting my own sound. 
um, kind of like by way of, of his sound, but still I wanted to be my own player, but we're so lucky now to be able to watch all these, all these videos. And I can be like, Oh, that's how, what his left hand is doing. Yeah. That's how he's doing this certain thing. Yeah. There's some players that nothing sets me right. Like listen to Ray Brown line or solo or a couple other players, you know, yeah. if I'm feeling a little bit, a little bit off. So that's, that's, uh, yeah. Um, I've got, I, I, you, I, I never have any scripted questions for this. So this is fun. You're a super great interview. I, I appreciate I tried trying to not cover ground that you've covered, you know, too much. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> In the past. Yeah, I don't mind. But I usually just wrap up with um, so, some sort of advice. When I mean, we've talked about like what the professional scene looks like right now and that sort of thing, but some sort of advice for young Katie that could be starting off at, at, Berkeley or any sort of younger version of yourself, what you might tell her. Um, you've got these amazing records and you've had all these accolades at this point. And obviously you've got a lot of career left ahead of you, but anything, any advice you might offer 17, 18, 20, hmm. you, you pick the age, Katie. You know, theory always came later to me. Just um, that I, I couldn't handle it early on. And even though I took all those, classes and everything. So maybe I would have tried to find another way to incorporate that. Um, because I couldn't, if you asked me to play a diminished arpeggio, I'd look at you and be like, well, I don't know, but if you played it on the piano or on the bass, I would play it right back to you yeah. and in the correct fingering and everything. Um, so maybe I would have tried to find a way to better that I could learn that educate myself that wasn't because I wasn't used to learning thing from a book like that so I would have and that's what I try and do with my students is how do they learn the best and that's what I got from John Clayton too it's like be your own teacher so I then I found out what works for me uh, but how to how to teach myself basically so I, I guess I would have maybe I would hope to have figured that out a little bit earlier but it's fine now I, I, I can do it here other people. Katie, thank you so much for chatting. Folks, check out everything she's up to at katiethoreau.com. And we've got that linked up as well as social media and everything else so you can get in touch with her. And Thank you, Jeff Chalmers of Discover Double Bass for the suggestion. What a cool career Katie's got going, and I just can't wait to follow along. She's got a lot more <laughs> in store. I know so. Thank you so much for listening to this show, and if you've been following the podcast for a few months or for years or since the beginning, regardless, I'm just so honored and thrilled to have you on board with all of us here. I get so much out of doing these interviews myself and it's just such a thrill to put them out and let the wider world hear them. And I hear from the wider world all the time at feedback at contrabassconversations.com. So if you'd like to reach out and suggest a guest or if you've got thoughts on today's episode with Katie or any episodes in general or some topics you'd like explored, that's a great way to do it. I respond to each and every message I get and I just love hearing from folks. Also, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, ContraBaseConversations.com slash subscribe has all the options. We've got an app. We're on anywhere you might want to listen to podcasts. And you can get in our email newsletter where we'll keep you updated with what's going on, both on the podcast and in the wider base world. ContraBase Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. If you're looking for a double bass, Mitch is making beautiful instruments in the Dallas area. Learn more at MitchMooring.com. Special thanks to Krista Copper and now Tim Pearson for going through and cataloging and archiving what's come out of the podcast in the past much appreciated. I am your host, Jason Heath, coming to you each and every week from San Francisco, California, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. 